stuff but her her family is like her parents are like in their seventies. Her sister has asthma, all kinds of stuff. Don't wait for a bunch of crazy instrumental stuff. Just keep singing. I ain't trying to be a whole bunch of measures or nothing by myself strumming chords. Boring. I was just gonna get like a tablet. So I can download the app to any of them. Well, the thing is, yeah, now it works though. You can iPad or whatever. Yeah. Where the yeah. 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 Yeah.
biggest street is like <laughs> That's the big one, yeah. The biggest one so far anyway. <coughs> well if there's a bigger one I'm getting it. It can be this big. <laughs> Good to see you here today. Before we begin worship, we're going to start off with a few important reminders. Uh, you must wear your mask at all times during worship. Please remain six feet from others outside of your family unit. We know it's hard, but please refrain from singing or responding in the service. But do feel free to dance and sway and move. Um, you may visit with others after worship on the line with no contact, so no hugging, no handshaking, and with social distancing. We also wanted to tell you about another project that we have coming up. It's uh, in, the, in the planning stages. And this is built on the work of an organization called Braver Angels. And the specific project is With Malice Towards None. 
Braver Angels was founded upon the idea of creating a world of civility and respect despite or maybe because of differing political views. And so the With Malice Towards None project asks us, who do we want to be? How do we want to behave through this election cycle? And perhaps more importantly, after the election cycle, regardless of the outcome of the election. And so Braver Angels has four core values, and those are on the next slide here. First is respect. Uh, assuming that everyone, even those with differing political views, are intelligent, are trying to do their best in the world. Second is humility. Uh, knowing that our leaders, no matter who we believe in, are perfect. Third is honesty. Allowing the space for everyone, no matter who they're voting for, to have their feelings, whether that's feelings of celebration or feelings of despair. And the fourth value is responsible citizenship, that we are all, on all political spectrums, responsible for making this a great country and a great world. Now, if you want to learn more about Braver Angels and the process, there is a handout that you can take on the table when you leave the service today. We'll be talking about this for the next four weeks. This is the, the first of those weeks. And then we are working to coordinate with some other congregations to plan some gatherings after the election that honors those values, that creates the space for people to both be in celebration or mourning, uh, just depending on the results. And secondly, to create a space where we can come together as a community to have commitments around how we treat each other. Because frankly, there is nothing more important than how we treat each other. kids. For today's children's sermon, we're going to talk about loving your neighbor. 
It was the most important lesson that Jesus taught. But what does loving your neighbor look like in everyday life? Well, that's easy, right? It's the people who live close to us, the people we know, our family. They're our neighbors. Taylor and I have a neighbor. His name is John, and he is terrific. He's the best neighbor you could have, the kind of neighbor that will plow your driveway when it's covered with snow or help you scoop water out of a flooding basement. It's easy to love our neighbor, John. But Jesus also said to love the stranger, the people that you don't know in your own town or across the world. I want you to think this week about how you could express love to a stranger. Perhaps there's a project that you could contribute to, like donating to a local food pantry, or adopting a child or family or village across the world. But the hardest one, the hardest one, and probably the most important to Jesus is that we are asked to love our enemies. Those are the people that don't love us back, who are unlovable, mean, unkind, maybe a little grouchy. What's important is that we remember that those people, they still want to be loved. They want to be seen and heard and known. And so how do we love our enemy? Well, first, we don't get caught up in our anger. We don't get caught up in being angry and hold on to that anger as we think about people who, who may be our enemy. We can do something kind for that person, to show them kindness, even when they have only shown us hate. On Friday evenings, our church participates in a sit-in, A group of us gather on the lawn outside the church and hold signs that say Black Lives Matter to support racial justice. A couple of weeks ago, a man came up to us. He was very angry. He was shouting at us and accusing us of being mean. We had a church member, Bill Ray, who demonstrating loving your enemy in the most beautiful way during that conversation. Bill took a pause. He took deep breaths. And he tried to find common interests between that man and our group. Things that we all believed in, that we could agree upon. Bill was demonstrating loving your enemy in that moment. So what are the things that you could do to love your enemy in your own world? Well, be kind with your words. Don't speak in anger. Encourage and even pray for people that you think of as your enemy. And particularly, if you're on social media, maybe you're on Snapchat or Instagram, and someone says something angry to you, don't respond right away. Take a pause. And say a prayer both for yourself and for that person. Maybe even get a good night's sleep before you respond. The Gospel of John says that the one way that people will know we are followers of Jesus is the way that we love one another. So love your neighbor, love the stranger, love your enemy, and spread the love. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John in chapter 10, verses 22 through 39. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple. 
my Father has given me is greater than all else. No one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods if those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled. Can you, say, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I have said I am God's son? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe in me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua ben Yosef, Jesus of Nazareth, brother, friend, guide, teacher, rabbi, shepherd, son of man, son of God, redeemer, Messiah, man, God, both. Jesus has been called many things over the 2,000 years since he walked in ancient Palestine. For a poor Palestinian Jew who never held office and lived on the outskirts of empire, he has captivated the hearts, minds, and souls of many over those 2,000 years. For Christians, he is not just a man. He is the Son of Man and the Son of God. The church has affirmed for centuries that Jesus is both human and divine without separation. Of course, many find this suspect. Some see Jesus as just a human, as a great moral teacher, even perhaps divinely inspired, but not divine himself. And hardcore skeptics deny that Jesus ever existed, despite evidence to the contrary. C.S. Lewis famously said that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. He is the source of much debate and many questions for us as Christians, though. He is the source of our faith. And Jesus is the way many of us know who God is and how God acts with us, but how do we know about Jesus? What about those who claim he didn't even exist? The evidence is basically this. Contemporary historians wrote about Jesus in the first century. He was significant enough to be written about by ancient Jewish historians like Tacitus and Suetonius. And the most important of those such historians was Josephus, who wrote in the first century, there was about this time Jesus, a doer of wonderful works. And he went on to describe Jesus' crucifixion, how he was called the Christ, and even mentions John the Baptist and Jesus' brother James. So there is indeed evidence outside of Scripture that Jesus indeed existed and that already in the first century he was considered the Christ. But of course, most of us, myself included, have never read the entirety of Josephus. Most of what we know about Jesus is from the New Testament. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, the vast majority were written between 50 and 95 AD, some 20 to 70 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. 
It's interesting to note how Luke begins his gospel. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully to write an orderly account. So Luke tells us that even though he is writing maybe 50 years or so after the crucifixion, that he has taken the eyewitnesses' accounts and only then has written. So even our Gospels, which are not our oldest sources, rely on these very early sources of information about Jesus. And in fact, our oldest source is St. Paul, not the Gospels. His letter to the Galatians may, in fact, date as early as 48 AD, maybe 15 or 20 years after the crucifixion. And in Philippians, which we think is from the year 55, Paul quotes a hymn that is even older. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. To the contrary of some who have suggested that later Christians turned the man Jesus of Nazareth into a God, from the very beginning of Christianity, Jesus has been considered the Son of God, as we see from that very early hymn. So what do we know about Jesus from Scripture? Our Gospels are reliable, even though they date a few decades after the crucifixion. Like I said, they rely on much earlier sources and eyewitnesses. But our Gospels are not biographies. Each was written to a different Christian community with different nuances and emphases to speak to their situation to help their audience understand Jesus as the Son of God. Yet it is from the Gospels that we know Jesus' life and teachings. Jesus was sent from the creator to the earth to accomplish our redemption. Because God desired reconciliation with God's people, there needed to be some way in which God could offer grace. So God took on human flesh in the form of Jesus Christ and came to earth. In the words of UCC theologian Lee Barrett, in Jesus Christ, we are confronted with the very godness of God. That God did not come as a conqueror or king, at least in their traditional definitions, as many expected and hoped. Luke tells us that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and Joseph, separately telling them that Mary would have a son born by the Holy Spirit and that they are to name him Jesus, that he is to be the Most High, the Son of God. Jesus takes on flesh as the form of the baby Jesus to be among us. From the beginning, Jesus' purpose is established by his name. Jesus means Savior. This occurred sometime around 4 BCE, before the death of King Herod. So our Christian calendar is off by at least four years. Mary and Joseph go to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem to be counted in the census. And it is there that Mary gives birth to Jesus and God is humbled in the form of a crying baby in an animal's trough. And shepherds came and worshipped the one who would be known as the good shepherd. Fully divine and fully human, Jesus was human in a very specific way. UCC theologians Ann Thayer and Doug Jacobson say he was a Jew living in Palestine during a time when that region was occupied and ruled by the Roman Empire. 
He was born when Augustus was Caesar and Quinius was governor of Syria. It was a time when Jews were downtrodden and many longed for the overthrow of the Romans. He was an observant Jew born into God's ongoing work with the people of Israel. Matthew tells us that after the wise men appear, the angel came to Joseph once again in a dream, warning them to flee to Egypt, that Herod wanted to kill the child. So in a reversal, as the Israelites fled Egypt, the holy family flees from their homeland into Egypt. And after Herod's death, Mary, Joseph, and the young Jesus return. And they settled in Nazareth, a backwater in Galilee. And we hear later in the Gospels, can anything good come out of Nazareth? From there, we only know one story out of Jesus' childhood. And of the four Gospels, only Luke mentions it. That at the age of 12, during the festival of Passover, young Jesus was found in the temple conversing with the rabbis. And Luke says that all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And we know nothing else of his coming of age simply that Luke says he increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The rest of Jesus growing up was either immaterial to the gospel writers or they simply did not know about it. Matthew and Mark jump to Jesus at 30 years old. Mark's gospel, in fact, doesn't even include the birth story or the flight to Egypt, but just begins at Jesus at age 30 and John the Baptist. And John's gospel, after his prologue, also begins with Jesus at age 30. His cousin John the Baptist was baptizing people in the river Jordan in the wilderness. And so Jesus went to be baptized by John. And in St. John's Gospel, John the Baptist, after his baptism, says, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Immediately after being baptized, Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days where he is tempted. And after facing and rebuking those temptations, he begins his ministry of teaching and healing Anointed by the Holy Spirit, he brought good news to the poor, proclaimed release to the captives, gave sight to the blind, freed the oppressed, and proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus performed miracles with his divine power, such as turning water into wine, casting out demons, stopping a hemorrhage for a woman who had been bleeding for 10 years, making the lame walk, and raising dead persons back to life. He taught followers how God intended them to live. He gathered disciples in his way and to teach them as well. Through his earthly ministry, Everything Jesus did was to show humanity how to love, how to love God, themselves, and others. Jesus offered a vision of life that was drastically different from what the authorities offered and envisioned a world in which many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus spent his time with those on the margins of society, women, the poor, the sick, Gentiles and others. Jürgen Moltmann says the messianic hope was always the hope of the defeated and ground down. The hope of the poor is nothing other than the messianic hope. The scribes, Pharisees, and Roman officials did not take kindly to Jesus railing against legalism, hypocrisy, and injustice. When he came to Jerusalem for the final time, they had him executed, crucified on a cross. Jesus did not have to die in such a manner. 
But he died in such a way because so many rejected the way that he offered and the kingdom of God's love that he proclaimed. Moltmann asks, what was Christ's essential power? It was love which was perfected through voluntary suffering. It was love which died in meekness and humility on the cross and so redeemed the world. Christ died because of our sins. But Christ in his wisdom could have escaped Jerusalem or knowing what awaited him never have gone. Yet he chose to go to the cross because he knew our full redemption lay in it. He died upon that cross and was buried in a tomb. But it was not God's will that death and violence should be victorious over the Christ. Instead, God raised Jesus Christ back to life on the third day, proving that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He had conquered sin and death and was reconciling the world to himself. He appeared to many after his resurrection and sent them out to continue his ministry. After these appearances, he ascended to heaven where he lives and reigns and until he returns once again. I believe that through all of this, through God's incarnation as Jesus Christ in his birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, we are redeemed through all of these things, not simply the crucifixion as some would have it. And frankly, I haven't a clue how this really happens, but I trust the witness of those who saw the risen Christ, those whose lives who, that have been transformed by him, and those who heart, whose hearts continue to be turned toward Christ, that their witness is true. Truly, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus, as Emmanuel, God with us, took on flesh, breaking into the earthly realm to walk among us and to teach us how to love. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who seeks all his lost sheep. Jesus was also a revolutionary who railed against the empire which so oppressed those he found himself in ministry with. Jesus in his earthly ministry and yet today reaches out to all, particularly the forgotten ones, the ones on the edges, on the margins. He breaks down the Berlin walls of our lives across class, sexualities, and even denominations. And ultimately, authorities found this new way of life that Jesus was teaching to be too threatening. So they crucified him. But death did not have the last word, and God raised Christ, conquering evil for all time. Jesus is indeed the Christ. is a great teacher, prophet, and revolutionary, but are the Redeemer. and the word was God. God came into being through him and without him not one thing came into being. The light of all people the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory. In the beginning of time, it's the way of love and truth. And yet from the beginning there have been mockers we forward the images a few screens? Keep going. One more, I think. There we are. The image you see on the screen is graffiti from Rome around the year 200. 
it's hard to make it out, but it depicts a donkey being crucified. In Greek, the description reads, Alexamenos worships his God. It was meant to mock a Christian named Alexamenos, and you can draw on what the artist thought. image we have of the crucifixion. But we, in spite of mockers, in spite of people who say by the story of Jesus, by the life live he was I am struck by the word priest of the disciples, he says, died a pretty horrific death as a result of their beliefs. They were crucified, they were beheaded, they were tortured. And all they had to say was, no, 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 actually it's not true, we didn't really see him. But they didn't. Those people would not have died for something they would have known was not true. But they knew it was true because they'd seen the risen Jesus. And as a result, this movement, it's a movement without precedent in the history of the world, swept the whole known world, and it has no parallel. The witness of Scripture and the witness of the apostles to the resurrection is indeed our evidence that Jesus is not only a great teacher, prophet, and revolutionary, but our Savior and Redeemer. So in closing, let me just share the words of our UCC statement of faith about Jesus. We believe in Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord. He has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us the Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of humanity, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen.
we come to our time of prayer to lift up in the community all those things on our hearts and minds for which we need God's presence and healing and comfort with us. So let us turn to God. I will pray uh, our prayer and then uh, we will continue in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We beseech you, O God, for your church throughout the world. May it grow in the faith of the cross and the power of the resurrection. May your spirit minister to it continually the redemption and reconciliation of all things. Keep it in your eternal unity, in great humility, in godly fear, and in your own pure and peaceable wisdom so easy to be entreated. Make it swift and mighty in the cause of the dominion of heaven. Cover, establish, and enlighten it that it may see through all that obscures the time and that it may move in the shadow of your wing with faith, obedience, sacrifice, and godly power. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign, sovereign, we pray as he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you please stand as we receive the benediction? Nourished by the shepherd's abundant love, go forth to walk in the paths of righteousness. Love one another in truth and action. May God's abundant blessings abide in you forever. In the name of God, our creator and Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our advocate. Amen. And as we start to break apart, as we start to be seeing each other as strangers or enemies, the ends of this rope begin to fray until we are broken like this. So let us remain bound together in the spirit of love. We'll sing everyone, and as you exit, you'll exit through those doors. We remind you not to, not to congregate inside. There are little pieces of rope on the table to the left out there to remind you to stay to bound, bound together in this community of Christ. There's also uh, a sheet you can take with more information about the Braver Angels with Malice Toward None project. And lastly, the organ pipe in the back is um, a place of offering should you wish to leave an offering this week for everyone. I was told a story of a challenge worth exploring full of life and love. Where people took a chance on the notion that with loving arms the door should open Chase away the fears It was time that was clear Sharing the light Tearing down the walls Expressing Yeah. 